Coming up on Week in Review, a free day at the zoo ends in violence. Plus, Kansas City loses one of its biggest philanthropists and the man who put the Metro on the life science map. It's also a week that sees the passing of the founder of Topeka's Westboro Baptist Church, Fred Phelps, once described as the most reviled religious figures in the country. Also in the next 30 minutes, the bi-state business border battle takes to the airwaves. And 20 years after the shuttlecocks made their appearance at the Nelson, are you ready for Kansas City's next iconic work of art? Hello again, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City. As we were away last week for the spring membership drive, this is two weeks in review for the price of one. And there has been some big news to report this week, helping us dissect those stories from News Radio 981 FM, KMBZ Dana Wright, from the Call newspaper senior writer Eric Wesson, from the Kansas City Star political reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling, and Star development writer Kevin Collison. Now, we start this week at one of Kansas City's favorite attractions the zoo, which turned into an ugly scene on Tuesday with some visitors reportedly running for their lives after shots were fired and groups of teens were witnessed getting into fist fights inside and outside the gates. Police tactical units were called in to restore order on what was the first of four free attendance days for residents of Jackson and Clay counties, part of an agreement with voters who approved a sales tax election to improve the zoo back in 2011. It's scary because when you come out and you see helicopters and folks in handcuffs, you know, makes you not want to come out. It's a shame that people got to do that to ruin it for families. It's impossible sometimes to predict where idiots will show up with guns, but idiots showed up with guns. A little pushing and shoving, that's why we had the uh, police here. You've got a lot of young people, it's, it's uh, spring break. We know that stuff like this is going to happen, but I feel like sometimes people come here for the entertainment because they know that people are going to be fighting. Is that what this was all about, Dana Wright? I don't know what started it. I do know free day at the zoo has to go. And before everyone starts screaming, well, you live in Johnson County, you don't have a vote. Randy Wistoff made the comment, he's one of my very favorite Kansas Cityans, that they're worried that free zoo day is going to get a bad reputation. I would argue he needs to worry that the zoo is going to get a bad reputation. I'm a Friends of the Zoo member. We go all the time. We go to Jazz Zoo. We take our kids to those camps. We spoke with a mother in Liberty who was walking out with her 5-year-old and her 11-year-old, and the guy pulled the gun and started shooting. She saw the whole thing. Randy Wistoff needs to worry about those families. They need to go to a voucher system, put the vouchers in the water bill, try to figure out an equitable way to do it for the renters. Free Zoo Day has to go. There are too many people. It is clear they can't control it. And I don't know what else to do. Is there a requirement as part of that voter-approved tax in 2011, Dave Helling, for those four days to be there? Well, there was Has a, that got to happen? Well, there is a commitment to do that, and, and, and everyone you talk to suggests they want to carry through with that commitment. I, I, I might disagree a little bit with Dana. I'm not sure the free nature of uh, the zoo uh, guarantees this kind of violence. Uh, you know, in, in a perfect world, every day at the zoo would be a free day, sure, that you would sure. let people come out and there wouldn't be so much attention paid to this. Um, I, I was at the Big 12 tournament uh, Friday, last Friday, and it, it took about 20 minutes to get inside the Sprint Center because everybody was either wanted or went through a metal detector. And my guess is that may be coming to the zoo as well at some point if this violence continues. Eric. Probably the gun was in the car, so winding people probably wouldn't because the shooting took place out in the parking lot. We've just got to face the reality that we've got to do something with parents. Uh, parents dropping their kids off at the zoo, probably inappropriate. We've got the Facebook funkin', as young people call it. Uh, so if they're getting into a beef with somebody, they log on, they say they're at the zoo, somebody else sees it, oh, such and such is at the zoo, they go to the zoo, that's where the fight breaks out at. We've got a serious core problem with family values. Parents need to step up and be parents. Uh, I saw on the news the other night somebody wanted to start another mentoring program. Mentoring young people is a good concept. We've got to start mentoring parents because that's where the problem is. You mentor a kid 
kid for two hours, three hours, once a week, twice a week, and they go home and they get some negative things going on at home, all your two or three hours just went out the window. You've got to work with the parents. I was talking to some of the ministers, and we're going to put together some programs. When we were that age, if our parents dropped us off, they didn't have to worry about what we did because we were afraid of our parents. <laughs> uh, at my house, there was a thing called whippings or whoopings, whatever you want to call it. So we were afraid of our parents. But these kids nowadays, they're not afraid of the parents. They're angry about something. But we can't get to the anger because we're dealing with the behavior. And the behavior overs overshadows whatever it is, opportunities, jobs, whatever. It's the, it's the so, behavior. So where does this leave the zoo now then. There was a meeting this week. Nothing was actually resolved. Um, but it is a hugely successful zoo, and this was part of the problem. We had huge numbers of crowds of people coming in, 4,000 people an hour. Part of this is also the success of the zoo. It wasn't that long ago that nobody was actually going to the zoo. Now it is a very popular attraction, well, I Kevin I agree with what Collison. Dana said. They need to be extremely proactive on reassuring people that the zoo is a safe place to go, that their families are, are not going to be threatened with violence. And I think uh, Eric is correct. We've got a problem here of a lot of under-socialized and under-parented adolescents just getting dropped off. It's very similar to the problems we're seeing at the plaza awesome. these days. And it is a epidemic of an issue right now that needs to be addressed, and it's going to take a lot of deeper social work than what's been going on. But I also think the zoo needs to take this and be very forthright about it because it doesn't take much of a reason for people to not go to institutions. Absolutely. In the I, I was listening to your show this week, Dana, and the, the caller who called in was a state legislator saying he was surrounded in his parking lot there yeah. by park, uh, cars from Nebraska and other states. Yeah. They would have had no clue this was a free day. They're coming to the zoo and yeah. being swarmed by people and seeing all of this happening, what type of impression does that well, give them of Kansas it, City? It, it breaks my heart. We had a woman from Wichita call in and she said, I'm going to go back and tell everyone this was the worst experience of my life. And that breaks my heart. We have the greatest zoo. If you look at that zoo 10 years ago, even five years ago, and what Randy's done in that time since, they have worked so hard to bring us to the point that we are now. And I hate for this, and you got to remember, this happened last year on Free Zoo Day, too. So there's been two incidents here. They've got to get ahead of it. Breaking up the free day, perhaps for Clay County residents on one day, Jackson County on another, putting a voucher perhaps wow. in a utility bill. Those have been suggestions. What else are the solutions that have been proposed at well, this point in time? I think being that that'll all be talked about, as I suggest, some sort of uh, heightened security. But let's be clear, Nick. Uh, Dana talks about free days. I talk about metal detectors. You hear parents over here. The, the elephant in the room are guns, the availability of guns in these situations. And that's changed, too, from Eric's day, you know, where kids can get hold of weaponry like this. That has to be part of the solution, or at least some examination of that ubiquitous availability of guns has to be a part of it as well. Two other quick points. Swope Park has been a problem in this regard for some time. The zoo is in Swope Park, so it's not limited to the zoo. And Kansas City is pushing for the Republican National Convention and met with the yes. board this week, uh, editorial board at the Star, and said, hey, get on board. We're making this big push. Stories like this cannot be helpful in that regard. I think city officials are worried about that as well. Last word for you, Eric. One of the things that I did this week in talking to the police officers, they a lot of them didn't know that it was free day. They said that there was very little to no communication between the zoo and the police department. And you had a lot of elements. It was a great day weather-wise. Mm -hmm. You had kids out of school. You had, uh, what, 19,000 people in the zoo, and they said like 4,000 people coming per through. Hour per going hour through. going yes. through. So maybe a better communication between the zoo and the police department. But, but the zoo is, did say they doubled the number of off-duty police officers that they had hired at the zoo that yeah. day. They went from four to eight. It's okay. not enough. All right. <laughs> One of Kansas City's biggest philanthropists and the man who put the metro on the life sciences map has died, James Stowers Jr founder of Kansas City-based American Century Investments, who went on to create the Stowers Institute for Medical Research, has died of natural causes. He was 90. What is his legacy, Kevin Collison? Well, his legacy is both as a tremendous businessman who created a, a, a huge investment firm that was very successful, American Century, and remains very successful, and the incredible tradition of largesse. I mean, he and his wife, Virginia, contributed a, a billion dollars, I believe, is the fund wow. to endow the Stowers Institute with that goal of helping Kansas City 
become known as a center for medical research. It's been instrumental in a lot of really positive things. Some of the folks at uh, KU Med said that they were instrumental in helping them get the National Cancer Institute designation. I mean, this is the kind of fundamental philanthropy that makes a metropolitan region great, and they are extremely uh, important to our community and what he's left behind, and it's certainly a major part in trying to push the future of Kansas City as being a medical research uh, hub. And they had the opportunity to move this facility or uh, open this facility in other cities. In fact, they were laughed at to say that they wanted to have this in Kansas City. It could have been in Boston and other places, sure. but they insisted on having it in Kansas City and to make it work here. But the Star Wars Institute has been there on Brush Creek. We see that building. It's been open more than a decade, Dave Helling. As average members of the public who don't always get the scientific picture, the life science picture, are we seeing the kinds of things that we expected, the discoveries, these cures that we might have been expecting when this was talked about at the very beginning? Right. As a layperson, I will tell you that you can read uh, uh, stories that suggest there is exciting, important work being done at the Institute. Whether it will yield the kinds of cures that I think the promise of the center was remains an open question, but of course that's the nature of science. Science. You can't really blame the Stowers folks uh, for taking longer than maybe even they would want to reach those, those kinds of uh, uh, cures. But the other important thing that we should mention about Jim Stowers is he bankrolled the campaign in Missouri to uh, allow or to, uh, uh, to uh, well, no, no, to, to institute some statutory protection for this type of research. As you recall, there was a big push over banning stem, what so-called stem cell research uh, on the ballot, and he really bankrolled uh, uh, the uh, political effort to make sure that this kind of endeavor can continue, and that's part of his legacy mm -hmm. as well. Very much so. And it was very much in their self-interest in that, you no know, question. they did not want to bring scientists to Kansas City, Missouri, who may be in jeopardy of being arrested for the research they do. And again, I think he helped avoid a yet another black eye that sometimes afflicts Missouri because of some kind of that, some of that legislation that gives us a terrible reputation nationally and internationally. But they also do a lot of pure research there. It's fascinating. One of, there was a recent story in the Times talking about how a lot of private philanthropists like this are now helping do a lot of research that the federal government is either unable to uh, or unwilling to do. And so he deserves a lot of credit for basically letting these scientists follow their own pursuits and their own dreams of coming up with, with uh, more pure science that hopefully then a lot of people would like to see then translated into uh, applied sciences that can lead to jobs and investment. Right, right. And we had a vote on a tax that would have done that, as we know, in the Jackson <laughs> yeah, County area, sure. and the public support was not quite where it needed mm -hmm. to be, which is why, again, guys like Jim Stowers are so important to this community. Well, also this week, Fred Phelps, founder of the virulently anti-gay Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, has died at the age of 84. A church official says he died of natural causes. The small Kansas church had become notorious for picketing military funerals and other public events and calling the deaths of soldiers and even children killed in school shootings punishment for the nation's acceptance of homosexuality. The church accused the media of gleefully anticipating Phelps' death after he recently entered hospice care. Does the death of Fred Phelps spell the end of the Westboro Baptist Church and the protests of funerals here and around the country, Dana Wright? You know, I would like to think so. It's such an ugly, ugly part of Kansas's history. And, you know, when, when people say, what's wrong with Kansas, that is that infamous book title, they think of people like Fred Phelps. And I would like to think, even after all of the words coming out about his excommunication and maybe they kicked him out right before his death, that maybe this would be the end of the cult. And it is a cult. I hate even calling it a church. It's a cult. Uh, end of it as we know it. Uh, but the nature of a cult suggests that that's not going to be the case. I mean, he... It's like playing whack-a-mole, had relatives and daughters and granddaughters and grandsons who have said they will carry on his legacy. Whether or not it will pack the punch, I don't know. The U.S. Supreme Court has said they have the right to do what they do within reason. Um, I wish they would all go away. We did a Fred Phelps death watch, and it was kind of tongue-in-cheek because I think, you know, you don't want to make fun of someone's death, but by the same token, I don't know very many people who, who had any response other than good when they found out he was gone. Good. We're glad he's gone. I'm glad he's gone. I just wish the rest of them would go, too. Which may explain also why the family is also saying this week there's going to be no funeral for the Reverend Phelps this week also. I don't think this type of protest, which as Dana suggests, has been protected at least to some degree by the Supreme Court, will ever go away, Nick. But 
but public attention to it can go away if we yeah. stop talking about it and covering it. You had video of it. We put it on the front page at the newspaper. You know, Fred Phelps was uh, uh, prominently mentioned on the New York Times website at his death. That is a victory for Fred Phelps to get that kind of attention. If we start, all of us, not just the media, but all of us ignore this type of thing, it may not go completely away, but it will certainly go underground, carried on only on websites or sort of the real dark underside of the of the Internet, and perhaps have less impact going forward. Eric. I, I think people have a, the protest part. They have a right to do that, and evidently the Supreme Court said they do. I think the difference was the extremism in which he did it, because it wasn't just, you know, him saying what he said about gays and, and homosexuality. It was just, he just showed up anywhere. I think uh, uh, Don and I were talking, and Joel Osteen was in town, and they were picketing in front yeah. of Joel Osteen. What did that have to do with anything? And I think it was just that sensationalism and extremism is that what gave him the platform to do what he did. And, and he was, I don't think there's any other way to put it, spectacularly grotesque in his choices. I mean, picketing uh, soldiers, soldiers being buried. I mean, and this is, it is news. It's shocking. It's awful. It certainly gave our state and our region a terrible reputation just because of the guilt of association that he was from Topeka. But can we point out two more radically different figures passing away this week between Mr. Stowers <laughs> and this guy? One yeah. man dedicated towards furthering human knowledge and research. Another guy that was just, you know, an insult to most people's sensibilities and, and, and just a cultish, as Dana put it. I will say, it gave me hope to read, even overnight, that there are two young women, his granddaughters, who are very publicly saying they have left the cult and they are now trying to understand everyone, everyone's point of view. And, and both of these girls are quoted as saying, look, we got out and we are so sorry for the hurt that we caused. They went into an inclusion museum and they said one of the first images they saw was shocking. Right there in the lobby of this museum was a photo of them with these awful signs. And they're so sorry that they were a part of that. And I just hope if, if two of them can escape, maybe more of them in, after Fred's death will, will go to and, and, and hopefully the house of cards will, will fall. As we move on on our Week in Review, the bi-state business border battle is showing no signs of letting up as we were trying to lighten your pocketbooks last week during our spring membership <laughs> drive. A big benefits and financial firm in Leewood was announcing plans to shop for new digs on the Missouri side of state line, CBiz. And Maya Hoffman McCann is looking to take its 400-plus employees to a bigger space and, according to the Kansas City Star, may be eyeing the Country Club Plaza and, more specifically, the Plaza Steps building recently vacated by the Polsonelli law firm. But have we now become so jaded to the hopping of businesses from one side of the state line to the other, even if this involves between 450, 450 jobs, perhaps, that we don't really care about this anymore? Well, what's fascinating, Nick, is this comes at the backdrop of some actual progress being made on the Missouri side to try to bring some sanity to the whole situation. Now, Ryan Sylvie introduced legislation that would ban the use of these particularly nasty my word, incentives, some people think they're great weapons for, uh, but where companies get to keep their employees' income tax. I mean, this is a situation where Missouri will tell a company, look, if you move here, you can keep all your employee income taxes for up to 10 years. Kansas has something very similar. Mr. Sylvie's trying to get that stopped. Uh, and so, we, at the same time, we had a letter from the gov our mayors and, uh, and some other economic development officials in Johnson County saying, well, you know, we need to have an even playing field and pointed <laughs> out a couple of different programs on the Kansas City side that are, are a little bit better than theirs. But the point is that they were essentially throwing cold water from what I could see on this idea. There is a school of thought, and Mayor Sly James has art, uh, articulated this, that if people's noses keep getting bloodied enough, maybe we'll finally come to some sense on this. But in the meantime, we've seen over $200 million in employee income taxes, both in Kansas and Missouri, go away over the next 10 years, and they're going to be kept in their employers' pockets and not to city or government services. Now, the business border war is playing out also in a pair of new TV ads running in Kansas City. That is Kansas City Mayor Sly James seething. If you haven't seen them, take a look. If you're paying the city earnings tax at all, you're probably paying too much. It's time to save hundreds of dollars a year. It's time to start a new business, income tax-free, in Johnson County, Kansas. 
It's time to prove your work matters. It's time to make sure this April's earnings tax bill is your last. No one likes to pay more than they should. Call your tax advisor to find out how your family can save. Alrighty, this ad is encouraging businesses to move to Johnson County, families for that matter, so they can avoid paying Kansas City's earnings tax. <laughs> now, Mayor Sly James saying it'll bankrupt the city. Who's behind the ad, Dave Helling? Well, there are actually two uh, groups, different groups, both with ties to Rex Singfield, a very well-known investor, millionaire, multimillionaire out of St. Louis, who has made opposition to both the earnings tax and the income tax more broadly. Uh, centerpiece of his lobbying efforts for a decade. The Kansans for No Income Tax Organization, though, is run by a guy, or the president is a guy named David Kensinger, who is one of the key advisors to Sam Brownback. And one of the subtexts of that ad is not just save money on the earnings tax if you move to Johnson County, but certain businesses now have zero income tax because of the Brownback tax cuts. And so that ad is kind of a triple whammy, if you will, for the anti-tax forces. It puts pressure on Missouri to match the Kansas cuts. It boosts Sam Brownback in Kansas because of the lack of income tax on some of those businesses, and then gets a whack at the earnings tax in Kansas City as well. That's like, as I say, some, something of a dream for the anti-tax crowd on that side of the state line, and that's why the ad is running. Okay, here's another ad running this week on the Missouri side of state line. Still putting off your taxes? Well, how about a little tip? If you're paying the city earnings tax at all, you're probably paying too much. That's right, you don't have to pay when you're not there. So all the days you spend away from downtown can save you hundreds, and who wouldn't want that? Nobody likes taxes, but there's no reason to overpay. Find out how you can ditch your earnings tax. Contact your local tax advisor or go to SaveMissouriJobs.com. So this ad talks about how you can avoid paying Kansas City's earnings tax. How can that be? Can we do an old-fashioned truth check on this? Who's behind this ad, and, and what's the purpose of this one, first and of all, Dave? Save Missouri Jobs is another Rex Singfield-related organization. Woody Kozad, the former Missouri GOP uh, chairman, is the person buying the ads. And again, the, uh, he is setting the table, he says, for a debate over Kansas City's 1% earnings and profits tax. But you can, you can actually do that, though? Well, you, if you live in Kansas City, you must pay the earnings tax regardless of where you work. If you live outside of Kansas City but work in Kansas City, you are not responsible for the 1% tax on the days you are not working in Kansas City, and you can get a refund. Okay, well, the, you know, as Dave points out, the cynicism of this thing is incredible. We've got a multi-millionaire in St. Louis trying to use a cynical ploy to get businesses to move to Kansas to put pressure on the Missouri legislature to change its income tax laws. And this is the second major swipe this guy has taken at the earnings tax in Kansas City. He put a lot of pressure. There was a major ballot issue. Kansas City now, because of Mr. Sinkfeld, every five years right, has to renew one, right. right, has to renew their earnings tax. And again, this is a classic example of where these gentlemen love to hammer at the revenue sources for local government, but never talk about what needs to be cut in order to meet these dramatic and they have this voodoo economic trickle-down theory that if you cut taxes somehow or another you're going to see your development in your in and it hasn't dave's done a lot of research it hasn't panned out in kansas and it's just so cynical it's ridiculous Alrighty, this year marks 20 years since the arrival of the shuttlecocks on the lawn of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. If it's taken you a while to become accustomed to them, get ready for a new iconic addition to our foremost institution of art. An all-glass labyrinth is going up on the south side of the Nelson lawn. The work called Glass Labyrinth is by Kansas City native Robert Morris and weighs more than 400 tons. Morris built a temporary glass labyrinth in Rio de Janeiro that gives you a sense of what is in store for Kansas City. It's made up of dozens of seven-foot-high, one-inch-thick glass panels that will form a massive triangle with a maze of interior glass walls. You get to walk through it in May. Now, the south lawn of the Nelson offers 365 free days access a year. <laughs> so is this going to be a problem, do you think, Eric Wesson? <laughs> the lady ran into the glass. She did. No. <laughs> no, I think it'll attract a lot of attention, a lot of people. It looks fun. I can't wait to go try it myself. I, of course, I hope I don't run into the glass. <laughs> we have the Bartle Hall pylons, of course, which also celebrates 20 years this year, Dana, right? We've got the shuttlecocks. Is you know this what? the latest iconic art for Kansas City? It is, and I love art, and it makes our city 
our great city grader. I, I, I'm pro glass labyrinth. Fine. I, you know, if anybody hasn't taken the time to take a walk around the Nelson Sculpture Park, oh, it is gorgeous. a beautiful place, and it's a great asset to our community. And this is just going to add to it. There's been several other beautiful pieces. Well, its art is obviously always in the eye of the beholder, but. Just the landscaping alone, coupled with the art, it's yes. one of the nicest public spaces in Kansas City. It really is. Now, we have we talked at the very beginning of the program about troubles at the zoo. There have been troubles at the plaza. Is this going to cause us problems? There's also going to be a lot of glass cleaning <laughs> that's yes, going to be yeah. involved in this, Dave Howling. That's going to be a big cleaning yeah, well, bill with this glass. I don't think it will cause us problems. I do think that one of the great trends in art is participatory art, where the art part of the art of this installation is the people in it. it, mm -hmm. it, it and that's what makes it interesting, makes it fun. Kevin's right. That's a great neck of the woods if you have a chance to go down on a Saturday afternoon to the Nelson Lawn. And by the way, in the videos that the city uses to promote itself to the Republicans and others, yeah. the, the Nelson is always prominently yeah. featured. It's one of the great jewels in Kansas City and founded at least in part by the former publisher right. of your Kansas City Star. So <laughs> and that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our esteemed <laughs> reviewers from the Kansas City Star, Kevin Collison and the calls Eric Wesson. She is 50% of Dana and Parks. Week stays from 2 to 6 on 98.1 FM, KMBZ Dana Wright. And hot off the press at the Star, Dave Helling. And I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.